For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. Isaiah 57, verse 15. This is the Essential Bible Studies Podcast. My name is Tim Young. And I'm Stephen McFarlane. Stephen, welcome back to the podcast. Great to have you back. Good to be back together in the basement. Yeah, got to have a little uh, Stephen McFarlane every season. <laughs> and I got to tell you something. You did this class a while ago on humility versus pride. And I was going back over, I was watching the video, and just to get through it and take some notes for this podcast. Mm-hmm. And I sped up the video to get through it quicker. <laughs> if you've ever done that, but no, I put like yeah. 1.5 times, you oh, know, yeah. and I'm just sitting there taking notes and everything. And I get halfway through and I forget that I did that. And I'm like going, why oh, Steve is on fire. <laughs> He's just ripping it up. He's like the Energizer Bunny That's tonight. Awesome. And then I realized that I had <laughs> spent you up fast myself. Class yeah. too. He's also very short tonight. <laughs> That's great. We got a lot ahead of us. We're going to take it slow. Well, maybe not so slow, but <laughs> we got a lot of verses here because we have a very important subject, as usual, an essential Bible study on the problem of pride. Hmm. We've had this season some practical things about sin. One of them was dealing with covetousness. This is another one of those that is so prevalent in the Bible, really gets at the heart of the matter of practically what sin is like in our lives. And this is this problem of pride. Mm-hmm. When you're reading through scriptures, it's one of those concepts that comes forward in a lot of different kind of words. So when we consider pride, you also got these terms like arrogance or arrogancy. You have presumptuous. You have haughty. You have lifted up. Puffed up is another one conceited or boasting. When you think about it, those are all terms that relate Mm -hmm. to this concept of pride. And then you have the opposite. What would be the opposite? Like humility, modesty, being abased or to make low or lowliness, like you're reading in the key verse there, contrite or of a broken heart. So whenever we see these words, we're getting into this subject. Right. Yeah, it's interesting that you're right. It's in some way the Bible makes it so simple on this subject that we can question just how simple of a of a characteristic this is to understand. But it's all over. It's throughout the Word of God. You'll see it right from the beginning to the end. Yeah. And it's interesting when you consider the Word of God and, and how God makes things simple for us. There's this contrast of twos that comes up throughout the Word of God. Think about back in Genesis, right? So you're talking like pride versus humility. This pride versus humility, this twos. contrast of twos. And okay. you go right from the beginning where you have the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. These contrasts that God places at the very beginning. You come to the next book, you come to Exodus, <laughs> and you have this battle, this stage set between Pharaoh, the God in Egypt, And Moses representing the God of heaven and earth. Mm. And so God just teases this out for us. And in some ways, we're thankful that God's done it that way. He didn't put us in a room and say, okay, here's 50 doors. Choose what type of character you're going to develop. Okay, here's (laughs) one of two options. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Right? Run in one of two ways. And I think there's some beauty in that, in that simplicity that God's put out for us. And we see this played out in all of these stories. And I think to your point, Tim, we're going to see that this aspect of pride runs throughout the word of God, but concurrent to it is humility to, to counteract that. Yeah. And we're going to see that these are forces at play against each other. And ultimately, I think by the end of this podcast, we'll see we have to choose a camp. <laughs> yeah. Where are we? What are we developing? And it's not easy, but there's a choice that God's put in front of us. Yeah. What's going to be the basis of your thinking? Mm. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about you know, God's assessment of pride Kind of get the importance behind it, see how he sees it. We're going to talk about the problem with pride. I mean, why is it such a big deal? Then we're going to talk about how to recognize pride in ourselves, in our lives, and what we can do to combat it, some antidotes for 
this pride so that we can develop this character that God wants us to have, to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's uh, get at this God's assessment of pride, because it's one of those kind of things that we say, well, what's the big deal, Hmm. right? Uh, Pride, is it really that bad of a thing? Well, let's just start in Proverbs. Proverbs has a lot to say about pride Mm -hmm. and humility. And this is probably a great starting place. It's in Proverbs chapter 6, in verses 16, 17, 18, 19. It says here, There are six things that the Lord hates. Seven are an abomination to him. And then it lists these seven things. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. So, this is something that God hates, it says there. That's a strong word. And in our society today, people often say, well, you can't hate. But there's things that the Lord hates. He despises. That word has the idea of being odious Mm. to or being a foe against. Or it's an abomination, it says. And that's that idea of being disgusting. And you can't really get around that word. It's a pretty strong word. But Mm -hmm. it really tells you the whole attitude of God towards these things. And the very first thing in the list? Yeah. Haughty eyes, haughty being pride. Yeah, right? proud look. Yeah, the proud look, right? And it's interesting how each one of these have a body part associated with them: eyes, and tongue, and hands, and heart, <laughs> and feet. Yeah, <laughs> right. The whole body there has these different aspects, but it's in the the eyes that are this pride or this haughtiness. Yeah, it, it's interesting, Tim, because if you come forward just two chapters, mm-hmm. Proverbs eight, God does the exact same thing. Here it is, Proverbs 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. So, again, this strong word. Yeah. And look at what God's going to associate evil with. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech. Again, I hate. Mm. So, it's as if God's making it abundantly clear. If you think in any way that I don't hate these things, (laughs) let me repeat it for you twice. And then it's not just the fact that it's pride. It's that God associates it with evil. It's like God is really making it clear for us, shining a spotlight on this type of behavior. And it's, I don't know how you else you read it, but to read it with a little bit of fear and trepidation and caution, and this should make us stop a little bit in our tracks. Yeah. Because this is how serious God deals with it, where there it is in Proverbs 6. And let me repeat it again in Proverbs 8. What it's really saying here is like, the fear of the Lord is hatred of evil, and it says that evil is pride. Yeah. So he's saying we're to have the same sentiments towards pride that God has. Yeah, you're starting to see this development of some other character, <laughs> right? Here's that opposing track. It's like God's kind of putting them parallel to each other. You're either running one way or the other. And if you're developing that fear of the Lord, then you're going to have the same determination that God has towards pride. Yeah. I don't think it's just kind of a bitterness, kind of anger aspect to it. It's more just, I really don't like that. I don't want anything to do with that. What a practical book that Proverbs is for us. And how interesting that in the book of Proverbs, pride is dealt with on numerous occasions. Yeah. And so again, I mean, probably something that most of our listeners have heard, this term that is, you know, a colloquialism, pride cometh before the fall. You know where that comes from? (laughs) Proverbs? Proverbs. (laughs) Yes. It's Proverbs 16. And so again, you just come forward a few more pages And there it is in Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so you're even starting to see this aspect of judgment that now starts getting brought in because of pride, because of this development of pride. And it's a, again, it's a scary thought to really think about where you're starting to even see this consistency that God is putting in the face of what pride will develop in others. And so here's this destruction. And actually, if you follow this throughout the word of God, it's a consistent end that those that develop pride will face. Right. And listen, it's one of the beauties of scripture because, again, God doesn't kind of just give us these, you know, one-offs and make us try to make these assumptions because of something that's said once. God makes a theme so consistent that you can just trace its, its usage all throughout the word of God. 
So here it is in Proverbs 16. You'd see the exact same thing if you're in Proverbs 15. The house of the proud, what happens to it? It gets destroyed. You go forward to prophecies in Malachi chapter 4. And what happens to those that are filled with pride? They're going to turn to stubble. They're gone. And so the Bible is absolutely consistent on what happens with this development of pride in our life. And it should really caution us for sure. And, you know, again, the benefit here is it's not just the writer to Proverbs. You'll see it throughout the Word of God. Different yeah. writers writing at different times came to the same conclusions <laughs> yeah. and recognize that this is the way that God deals with it. Right. Yeah. So God is opposed to the proud who lift themselves up, especially in the latter days. It says that's what God is coming for, to put down the haughty looks of man. Yeah. That'll be his final judgment against the kingdoms of men. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really because we have these lusts of the flesh inside of us. And one of the key characteristics is this aspect of pride that comes from within ourselves. And Jesus Christ himself pinpoints pride as one of these elements. In Mark chapter 7, and verses 20 through 20. Two, he has his own list of what comes out of a person that defiles him, those things that are in his heart that really defile him before God. And he lists out all of these sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, kind of mm. some obvious ones. Yeah. But then he goes into things like envy, slander, pride mm -hmm. is in the list. Pride is there. So Jesus Christ pinpoints that as some of the workings of the flesh, these lusts of the flesh that we have in ourselves that are part of the worldly thinking, mm -hmm. the thinking of the flesh. And <laughs> so ever since the Garden of Eden, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the fall of man, that has been the key point. And it, it's never stopped, but it actually is said it's going to get worse and worse. The Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 3 emphasizes this as a characteristic of the latter days. I believe we're living in the latter days mm. before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is a sign of the times. And let me just read this section to you. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Yikes. <laughs> Yeah. I and mean, he really lays it down on the line. And when you go through and you kind of analyze each one of those, there really is an emphasis. I mean, he mentions the proud, mm -hmm. arrogant lovers of self. Yeah. That's really a form of pride, isn't it? Or he has swollen with conceit in verse 4. Hmm. So when we look out in the world around us, what are we seeing? We're seeing this elevation of pride and arrogancy of humans Against God, yeah. those two that you were talking about before, those two contrasts. Yeah, it's as if God is just stacking up these bricks on top of each other to make it clear for us where you have all of these independent terms, and yet the one that seems to be most prevalent in this list is all connected to pride. <laughs> yeah. As you just demonstrated, four times it seems like it just builds on top of each other. You can see it's a real problem. And what's interesting, Tim, is like, what's missing here? It kind of hints right at it at the very end of that verse, verse four. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the main issue. Yeah. Is God is wiped out in all of this. So much so, it's almost as if it's showing to us just by mentioning God at the very end of that. <laughs> that's where God falls when all of these things are elevated. Yeah. To the end of the picture, basically, he's out. He's out of the scene. And so you think when you picture pride here, the real heart of the matter is that pride becomes this characteristic that is prevalent when God is not. And that's a bit of a heavy thing to think about mm -hmm. because probably for many, I know for myself, there's aspects of pride in your own life. 
But when you put it that plainly, the way that scripture just puts it plainly, that pride is prevalent when God is not, that can be heavy to think about. And how do you elevate and ensure that God is still active in your life to where you can help push pride to the side? As opposed to here in 2 Timothy 3, where God is pushed to the side. Yeah, we're talking about the problems with pride. Mm. That, to me, would be the the main one. Yeah, It is blocking this relationship that we can have with God. Mm. We're basically saying, I can do this on my own, I don't need you kind of aspect. And that's really the problem. (laughs) That's interesting to think through. If you just made it crystal clear in your mind, if you had a relationship that you really cared deeply about, just think about a relationship that means a lot to you, a friend, a spouse. And if there's a boulder in between the two of you, (laughs) what will you do with that? Do you leave it? Do you slowly chip it away? Do you bring in forklifts and (laughs) move it with might? (laughs) You do something to remove the blocker. And here, to your point, pride blocks that relationship with God. What are we doing about it? Yeah, We can't allow it to linger. We can't allow it to build. We can't allow it to grow. We can't allow any part of it to be there. And so, again, God is just making it so clear for us where ultimately pride is where God isn't even in their thought. That's kind of what we're seeing here. And that's what's echoed from the psalmist is when pride is there, it's because God isn't even in their thoughts. So I'm sure that hurts God, mm. his feelings, but he also is very concerned about our lives and reflecting his qualities of love and mercy and forgiveness. And so I think another problem of pride is that it's self-centered, like mm. we just read there. Mm-hmm. And I think here is one passage in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49, which really gets at the heart of the matter of the problem of pride. Ezekiel 16, verses 49 and 50. And what this is, is this is Ezekiel's commentary on Sodom and Gomorrah. So, we often think of Sodom and Gomorrah being burned with fire and brimstone at the judgments of God because of their fornication. Ezekiel doesn't mention any of that, though. (laughs) Interesting. It's very interesting. And his commentary, though, I think really gets at the heart of the matter. What we see in Genesis of the evil wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah is just some of the fruit of this mentality of pride that had been developed in that city. And that and that's what was really so odious to God. So it's Ezekiel 16, starting in verse 49. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. Hmm. So pride. Mention first again too, Tim. Isn't yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's three things there. You have pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease. So that's the problem when we start seeing this wealth that prospers in society, it brings forth this aspect of pride, Mm. and that takes center stage. And you forget about the poor and needy, right? And so that's really what God's concern was, and one of the the problems of pride is this kind of self-centeredness. Yeah, and you see why God has to deal with it, because it brings with it this contention between the relationship that God's trying to develop with those that would seek to follow him and those that are choosing not to. Yeah. And that, again, follows consistent with the theme of Scripture. Because in the Word of God, it's very clear to us that pride brings out this contention. <laughs> yeah, And it brings out this characteristic and this attitude of contentious behavior where, you know, we're even told, again, <laughs> take a guess where it's brought up that pride brings contention. I'll give our <laughs> listeners two seconds to tell me the book. It's in Proverbs. Proverbs? Yeah, <laughs> it's in Proverbs again. And maybe that's part of the outlet of this podcast, Tim, is you just spend some time. What's beautiful is there's 31 Proverbs. You could just start by reading one a day. And 31 chapters. 31 yeah. chapters, yeah. And, you know, you could just read it and you'd see these themes come out and you'd see the development that God wants us to make. Yeah. As opposed to pride being developed. But it's interesting because there in, in Proverbs 13 and verse 10, we're told where there is strife, there is pride. Mm. It's just so clear. 
And again, that's perhaps a verse that makes us just look into our relationships a little bit too. Yeah. The relationship that we're developing with God, the relationship that we have with those around us, where there is strife, there is pride. <laughs> just makes you think a little bit. That's pretty point blank. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Again, it's getting at the heart of the matter. So yeah. Yeah. if there's some sort of contention, really pride develops in this contempt for others. Hmm. But this looking down, and the Bible often talks about that, you know, yeah. don't consider yourselves better than others. That's pride. Mm-hmm. And when you do that, that's what really causes this contention. So we have to be respectful and listen to others' opinions, and those kind of things. And to have that humble spirit is really to be able to analyze yourself all the time mm-hmm. and think, I'm really not that special. I mean, I'm, <laughs> it's not doesn't mean that you're always wrong, you know, yeah. but it's just how you approach that. So the other problem with pride, and I just picked this up when I was looking at this, is mentioned for us in a small prophet called Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. It's so small, I can't even find it right now. <laughs> <laughs> now, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4 is one of the passages of the Old Testament that's quoted most in the New Testament. Oh, interesting. That the just shall live by faith. And we just had a podcast earlier this season about God is just and the justifier. Hmm. And so, Paul really likes this verse. But if you read the whole verse, it says this. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. So in other translations, this is the ESV. It says puffed up, but that's pride, isn't it? So other translations translate that as pride or being lifted up. I guess literally the Hebrew means to be swelled up. Yeah, it brings about some pretty clear imagery, doesn't (laughs) it? Yeah, Yeah. puffing out your chest or whatever. But you see in this verse, the contrast is between those who are prideful and those who have faith. I don't know if I've ever thought about it that way, but it's true that pride is the opposite of faith. Hmm. Faith is a trust and reliance in God, right? Whereas pride is this self-sufficiency, I'm special, I can do this on my own kind of aspect, right? Yeah, that's that's really interesting because it starts to really frame the question in our own minds of how can we start to recognize pride in ourselves? Yeah. Listen, the weight of what we've just talked through, all of those verses, you stack those up on your shoulders and you're basically on the ground. (laughs) It's just, (laughs) it weighs you down so heavy to see it so clearly. But I think that's a verse that really should get us starting to think about how do we recognize pride in our life? And it leads us into exactly as you've just mentioned. We find that in John chapter 12. Because in John chapter 12, speaking of the Pharisees, it shows this proud attitude, this lifting up where it said that they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. There's this puffing up, this blowing up of your own chest (laughs) because of what you've been able to do. And others recognizing that and pushing that onto you and it feels good. And, and yet maybe there's something here for us to start to recognize pride in ourselves, this dangerous characteristic and attitude that can be developed. I think it's that just general attitude of looking for that praise. And I think this is in all of us. You know, we can say like, oh, I'm a humble person, all those kind of things. But <sighs> I think we see in ourselves like we want to impress other people. Yeah. We want to, you know, we want to be liked. We want to be adored. We want to be an influencer, all those kind of things. That's really pride talking. I love to play guitar Mm -hmm. and I see that as a trap sometimes because you want to play guitar and you want to impress people and you want to be like a a rock star and you kind of get that. Oh no, no, that's not, that's not why I want to, I don't think that's right before God, but you can see how that thinking is so easily just creeps in in different ways in our life. Yeah. It's so easy. Another one is just this whole attitude of becoming self-righteous, which Jesus points out in in the Pharisees. In Luke 18 and verse 9, he told a parable about some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So he talks about the Pharisee who prays, saying, I'm glad I'm not like other men. (laughs) 
and he starts saying all the great things that he's done. If that's compared in verse 13 to this tax collector, who is really despised among the Jews, he's standing afar off and would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Mm. That's such a great parable and just the contrast there, the two ways, like you were talking about. To be like the Pharisee is lifting himself up, exalting himself, yeah. and just boasting about his accomplishments versus the task collector. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's called out in the book of James, right? Boasting yeah. is evil. <laughs> Again, yeah. there's a lot of very simplistic phrases that the Bible puts forward for us. And that's a great one that ties into that story, right? Boasting is evil. I think it really drives again to probably some of the heart of what pride and this characteristic that's developed, it speaks to our motives largely, right? Why is it that we do what we do? Yeah. And, you know, are are we compelled to help others, to work hard, to further the work and the will of God? Are we interested in developing the character of God or... Are we more interested in some of the examples that you've kind of walked us through and and furthering how we're viewed within our community or our workplace or amongst our peers? Is that what drives us? And that's why we're doing what we're doing. And that's how this development of pride could really start to come about, where we want that, right? That means a lot to us. There's this boasting that comes from it, loving the praise of men more than the praise of God. And, you know, I think it's difficult not to be lifted up in those ways. Right? That's a challenging task. If it was easy, Tim, the Bible wouldn't spend so much time talking about <laughs> yeah. pride. Yeah. Right? And I think that's why God has to put it. It's it's addressed so often. And so knowing how difficult it is, there's a level of appreciation that it's not just this mental exercise to go through once, to just listen to this podcast and think we're gonna sort it out for yeah. you. I'm sorry yeah. we won't. <laughs> right? This is a daily reminder. Yeah. Something that has to be consistent and always thought about as we go throughout our lives to try to develop the character of God. I think you were talking, you said James when you talked about boasting. I think you're talking about chapter four and yeah. verse 16. Yep. Yep. And this passage here in the context really shows how subtle it can be. Mm. Uh, and that's how sin is, right? It's yeah. very subtle. But he's basically saying, when you say that you're going to go do this tomorrow, you're going to go out and you're going to go shopping and you're going to go out and do some special thing at your mm-hmm. job or something like that. James actually calls that boasting because hmm. he says, you should say, if the Lord will, yeah. I will do this or that. And, oh, you know, just just my plans in my life just to go and do what I'm going to do. That's a form of boasting, form of pride. Well, if you're not involving God and saying God's really the ruler of my life, he's going to will that I do this or that. Yeah. And it is. He says – you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Yeah, it gets back to the same phrase. Pride is prevalent when God is not. <laughs> it's just <laughs> yeah. the same, right? Yeah. I think, too, you know, we're talking individually here, like we're being introspective, looking at ourselves, which is very true. But even in group settings, there is a prevalence of pride amongst man, especially when it comes to things like patriotism. If you get involved in politics, let's make America great again. You know, those kind of things are lifting up people to be prideful. Uh, When you look at the problems of racism, that's built on pride for a race, which is totally wrong. And things about human rights, when you look at the basis of people saying, I have rights Hmm. for this or that, it's based upon this idea of pride, arrogance in humans against God, like what we've been talking about. But even just in the little things of life, sports can get us involved in this whole aspect of pride, of competition against Mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. But even you can go to a church, and the church, the group itself, can be self-righteous, full of pride. So even if you go spiritually to place, it doesn't mean that it's not going to be affected by pride. So we have to watch for it in all corners of ourselves, but also amongst ourselves in group settings. Yeah, you really see how it permeate in so many different ways. Yeah. So what's the antidote, Tim? (laughs) (laughs) Like you said, it's hard. Yeah, I remember reading a book 
It's called The Genius of Discipleship. One quote in particular was interesting as you think through this aspect of humility and what we should develop, where the author writes that when people are conscious of their humility, they are on their way to losing it. (laughs) It's again, it's one of those, I know, right? (laughs) It's one of those quotes that kind of makes you say it out loud. There's this kind of pull. It seems like there's a bit of this oxymoron that's at play here. Like, hold on a second. I'm I'm humble. (laughs) But the more you think about it, the less humble you might actually be. And it's the contradiction of humility. The less you focus on it, the stronger it can become. And so again, it's almost as if God doesn't make things easy, but that's not the way life is before God. You know, we're told to carry a cross every day. (laughs) It's meant to be difficult. And so developing this aspect of humility should actually be something that almost becomes a little bit subconscious. It just starts to develop in the way that you recognize God in your life and you recognize why you're doing what you're doing. It's led by furthering the will of God. Yeah. So we can talk about like antidotes. I think there's three big ones to me. First of all, I think it's how we think about God in our lives. So I've heard it termed this way, the practice of the presence of God in our life. Mm. So when we talk about when we're prideful and there's no place for God, right? If we're practicing putting God in our lives, we're going to develop this humility naturally, I think, because we're going to think about God as big and us being small. And I think that's always how the faithful portray themselves in the scripture. Like Abraham says, like, who am I? I'm just dust and ashes to talk to God. (laughs) Dust and ashes. Abraham is the father of the faithful, right? But in all aspects of our life, we're looking for and just pondering those moments where we might just consider creation. Like in Psalm 8, the psalmist says, when I consider the heavens, the work of thy hands, what is man that you are mindful of him? Hmm. So it's just this whole aspect is just every day giving yourselves over just to thinking that God is in heaven, I'm on earth. Just this relationship that you have, yeah. like I'm just a speck of dust yeah. before the almighty God. It puts you in your place, yeah. right? Just yeah. constantly develop that thinking. Yeah, and it's interesting the way in which it's brought out. You talk about that relationship that's being developed and that frame of mind. It's often kind of termed as just like this servant mindset. Yeah. You'll see that in a lot of Christ's teachings. Yeah. Where it's all about essentially feeling unworthy, but it's more, it's about developing this thankfulness for what you have. And it's interesting when you start to see how it's meant to be developed in us. You can even see in in many of the examples, his disciples were struggling with this. Those that got to see and interact with Jesus on a daily basis. And they struggled with this. And yet it's this servant mindset that is meant to be developed in us. To where we recognize our place and where God is in comparison to where we are. Yeah. And there's a thankfulness that comes with that development. I think that thankfulness is the key there, Steve, because a servant says, well, I don't really deserve this. Yeah. And it makes you grateful. Yeah. And if you go back to that Second Timothy chapter 3 passage that we read earlier, ungrateful is one of the qualities hmm. of the last days mixed in with this idea of pride. So if you develop thankfulness through prayer, that's an antidote to pride, definitely. Hmm. Yeah. Here's a third one. I think we need to be kingdom seekers. So when we talk about collective pride with groups, politics, whatever sort of group it is that's in this life that is trying to do something substantial in this life and make, make a name for themselves, we realize that God has a lot bigger picture. Yeah. Right? Christ is coming back. Christ is going to set up this kingdom of God on earth. And that's what we are. We are kingdom seekers. So we're not seeking a name for ourselves in this day and age. We're looking forward to the future. And there's a wonderful aspect about King David. Now, King David was one who could have very easily developed a lot of pride. Because when you're in that kind of position, you have a lot of power and authority, you have a lot of wealth. Yeah. But he has a wonderful prayer in First Chronicles 29. It's just really, you'll have to go back there and read it on your own or running out of time here. But it is a wonderful attitude where he prays to God and he says, listen, we're dedicating this temple to you. And David, in so many words, says, this is crazy because you gave us all this stuff. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, who are we? to give you this when you've already given us everything. 
And it's just like a, this astounding, humble aspect that God gives us everything and that his is the kingdom, his is the power, his is the glory, like in the Lord's Prayer. Right? Yeah. So really, I think we need to be kingdom seekers. Yeah. I mean, hence why God is the one who exalts us. Yeah. That's it's up to God to do, not us. And again, we'll go back to James chapter four to prove that point. It's it's funny as we're kind of talking through this, Tim, we're going to a lot of the same places, which is interesting. Yeah. In, in James chapter four and verse six, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So here's God who's exalting, who's giving this grace, who's providing it to those that can develop this humility. Yeah. But it's interesting. He opposes the proud. You just think for a minute. Ah. I, I wish they could see your facial reaction to that. <laughs> because like, imagine, that's a scary thought. Imagine going against God. Or God going against you. God, good God luck. opposes the proud. Yeah, good yeah. luck. So it's interesting as you kind of think through that God is the one who exalts and he opposes the proud. Think of where we should be focusing our development of character. You know, Peter says the same thing. And I studied mm-hmm. First Peter. It's First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. When I looked at that word opposes, it's really interesting to look it up in the Strong's Concordance because it means God arrays himself. It's almost like a battle term, arraying yourself against. Mm-hmm. Like it's – that's how uh, serious it is. Like, I mean, who's going to battle against God? And, but that's who God wants for his kingdom. He wants those who are lowly of heart. So as you read that key verse in Isaiah 57, verse 15, God dwells with those that are a broken and contrite spirit, who are lowly, who are humble. And that really brings us to our greatest example, really, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you think about his life, and what he did, and his sacrifice. It's all marked by this humility. Christ had no pride in him. He had no arrogancy. And so when we look at his life, it's exemplifying all that we've been talking about. And it's really brought out in Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to just read this passage, and I think it really just speaks for itself. It's a little bit of a long passage. I'm going to read Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 9. And we're going to see this all wrapped up in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God Mm. the Father. I don't think I can add anything to that. I think it just says it. You you can see in those words everything that we've been talking about. Yeah, it's a beautiful summary. But it's interesting too, Tim, because it It starts with a challenge. Let this mind be in you. Yeah. There's a bit of a challenge in those words. As we kind of sit and you think about that mind being developed. Is it being developed? How are we fostering that development of the mind of Christ within each of us? It's interesting that it would kind of start in that way. Putting us a little bit on the hot seat of of really thinking through how we're aligning to the character of the Son of God. Right. Well, that's a great place to wrap it up, Steve. Hmm. Another great conversation. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time, Tim. See you next time. (laughs) Our goal on the Essential Bible Studies podcast is to glorify God and to encourage others in their walk in Christ. Think about how you could use the podcast. It's really easy just to ask a friend or acquaintance, do you listen to podcasts? 
and hand them an Essential Bible Studies podcast business card. If you'd like to do this, then I'd like to send you one of our media kits to promote the podcast. Just get in contact with us at our website, www.essentialbiblestudies.org, or direct message us on Instagram or Facebook. Freely you have received, so freely give. This is a Christadelphian podcast supported by the Book Road Ecclesia in beautiful Ancaster, Ontario, Canada. Until next time, my dear friends, may God help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen.